All right, great. I see a hand up, which may mean that somebody can hear me. Or you're just, you know, waving. Anna can hear me. That's good. Always makes me feel better. So why don't we go ahead and get started? <laughs> so my name is Michael Devlin. I'm with the Michael Devlin Group, and I also have a real estate school. And the topic tonight is really how to launch a successful real estate career. Now, the let me make sure it's working. All right. So usually when we're we're doing this, there are three things we want to talk about. Number one is why real estate. And I'm going to go into a little bit about what's going on in the market right now, but I'm going to be having a webinar coming up on Wednesday at 11 o'clock in the morning where I'm going to spend a lot more time on the market and what's happening in the market. But we're going to talk in general about why people are attracted to a career in real estate. Another topic would be how to choose an office to affiliate with. Uh, we'll talk about you know some of those criteria that you might want to look for. And then in how to get started, we're going to talk about how do you get a real estate license? How long does that process take? How much does all this cost? Right? I hope that sort of sounds like what you're interested in because you know that's what we're going to talk about. Um, why real estate? So first, let's talk about some definitions. There's the word broker, the word salesperson. Now, those two um, words refer to a type of license. You could either have a real estate broker's license or you could have a real estate salesperson's license. A real estate salesperson can do pretty much everything the broker can do with two exceptions, right? There's two things that you can do with a broker's license that you can't do with the salesperson's license. Number one is you can be independent. So salespeople have to work for brokers, but brokers don't have to work for brokers. Brokers can be independent. The other thing you could do with a broker's license is, well, you could brag about it, right? You could tell people that you have the advanced license, the big license, the graduate license, all of that sort of stuff. Most people don't know what you're talking about, nor do they particularly care. Now, to be a broker, you need to have two years full-time experience in real estate or four years part-time experience in real estate. And you have to take more college courses and you have to pass a much longer, harder test. So we'll talk about how to become a salesperson first because well, you're going to have to become a salesperson first. Then there's the word agent. Now, the word agent is a word that refers to a relationship where one person called the agent represents another person called the principal in dealings with other people who are, well, they're called other people, right? So they're the third party. If there is no third party, then there is no agency relationship. Now, the reason I mention this is over the years, I've often had people come to me and say, if I get into real estate and I'd like to buy a house for myself, and uh, my family, can I be my own agent in the transaction? I've, I've been asked that question a lot. Now, technically, legally, the answer is no. You cannot be your own agent because by definition, an agent represents somebody else in dealings with somebody else, right? If you're representing yourself in a transaction, you're a principal, which means you're not an agent. Now, that, by the way, was a accurate and technical answer to their question. However, I also know that that's really not the question they were asking me. The question they were really asking me is, if I get my real estate license and I want to buy a house, can I save money on the commission? And the answer is yes. That's not because you're acting as an agent in the transaction. You're not. It's because you're a licensee. And because uh, when we use the word licensee, we're referring to anybody with a real estate license. It could be a broker's license. It could be a salesperson's license. Um, and because of that professional relationship, you can save money on the commission when you buy and sell your own property. But that doesn't mean you're an agent in the transaction. And then there's the word realtor. The word realtor is a copyrighted designation of the National Association of Realtors, which is a trade association, which is kind of sort of like a union, right? It, it, it's like a union. In fact, it's kind of like the Teamsters Union in that, let's say I want to drive trucks commercially. Do I 
have to join the Teamsters Union? And the answer is no. I might choose to join the union because there's some jobs you don't get and they have benefit packages and training and job placement and stuff like that. But in order to drive a truck commercially, all I really need is the license. And if I have the license, it's legal for me to drive trucks. So is, is there a law that says that you have to join the Association of Realtors, our union, just because you want to sell real estate and the answer is no. Now, you might choose to join the union, particularly if you're going to be selling one to four units of residential dwellings, right? One to four units residential. If you're doing that, you're probably going to join the union because it's being a member of the Association of Realtors that gives you access to the multiple listing service, access to the forms we use, as well as the key that unlocks properties when the owner is not there. Um, but if you're doing other parts of the business, you might not need to join the union. Um, there's two ways in which you could have a real estate license. You could either work for a broker, but you could also not work for a broker, but you, you, you need to work for a broker. Now that may sound you know jumbled, but the um, the reason I, I, I talk about this is people have asked me, they've, they've said like, well, I don't really know what I want to do with my real estate license. I'm not really sure. I think it's a good idea, but I don't know. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Do I have to figure all that out before I begin the process of being licensed? And the answer is no. Even if you don't have a broker to work for, you can go ahead and get a real estate license. But the real estate license is... Um, is um, the real estate license is a um, the real estate license? What am I trying to say? Um, it can be issued either in an active status or as a non-working status. So a non-working real estate license is like a non-working car in that you could have the car and you could show people the car and they could even sit in the car, but they can't really drive the car because it's not a working license. So you can go ahead and get a real estate license without having a real estate broker. And what you'll have is a non-working license. You can renew it every four years. You can keep it indefinitely. And the reason some people do that is because they end up working in what we call an affiliated field that doesn't actually require a license. But if you want to use the license for selling real estate, helping people buy, sell, or invest in real estate, and to be paid a commission, you need to have a broker in order for that to work. <clears throat> what did you do with a real estate license? Well, I bet you already knew you could help people buy and sell residential properties, homes, and get paid a commission. The same is true for commercial. We have a commercial division. I'm in escrow right now in a commercial property in San Leandro, and it's it's a different world. I, I've had people say to me, I don't want to sell residential real estate. I just want to sell commercial real estate. How do I get a commercial real estate license? And the answer is there, there, there's no such thing, right? There's just a real estate license. And if you have a real estate license, you can do residential, you can do commercial, and you can do loans. <laughs> so loan agents, not all loan agents, have real estate licenses. So there's other ways to do loans. If you work for Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or Chase, you don't need a real estate license. There's other financial lenders you could work for without a real estate license, but mortgage brokers are real estate brokers. And the loan agents that work for them are real estate agents who have had their license endorsed. And endorse means you take another course and take another test and you pay another fee and you get what's called a mortgage loan originator endorsement and then you can do loans. But the beginning part is you have to get a real estate license. Property management also requires a real estate license. If you don't own it and or you don't live in it, you need a license to be compensated to manage it. Management means finding renters, negotiating leases, collecting rent, fixing, you know, spending money on the, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's the same license. And business brokerages are when you're selling a business, but not necessarily selling the real estate. So for example, let's say Harry's hardware store is for sale and you help Harry sell his hardware store. 
there's a chance that Harry doesn't own the building and doesn't own the land. All right, there's a chance that he doesn't. So when he sells the hardware store, he's not selling real property. He's selling personal property. And real estate agents can sell businesses even when real property is not involved in the sale and get paid a commission. You also could do this if you had a license from the Department of Corporations. So we do most of what's on this list, and not loans, but most of everything else. Why real estate? <clears throat> well, one of the most common reasons that I'm told as to why people join real estate is they want freedom and independence. A long time ago, I used to work for a really crazy company. And what, what was weird, I mean, it was really an odd system I thought that they had, because what they did is they told all of us what time we had to be at work each day. It was like they had some sort of a rule, right? That everyone had to show up at a particular time. They would tell us when we could go to lunch. They would tell us when we could go home. And I believe that is called a job, right? I think that's what that's called. And so a J-O-B, right? The journey of the broke. So being in real estate is not like having a job. Being in real estate is much more like having your own business. And the people that are most successful at real estate are people that have always wanted to have their own business. And it wouldn't hurt if you had some business acumen. And the relationship that we have to our associates is more like a business consultant or a business advisor to a business owner than it is an employer-employee relationship. You, you understand what I'm saying? We're not going to call you at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, where are you, right? We're not going to do that, right? You have freedom and independence to basically do the business the way you want to do it. Do you know what the biggest disadvantage to being in real estate is for many people, the biggest disadvantage? And the answer is freedom and independence, right? That's sometimes, there's an old saying that freedom is a gift, not always wisely used, you know? There was the story of the guy that joined a tech company and it was his first day and, you know, he's being shown around and, you know, he's having lunch, you know, in their, you know, buffet. And he meets this guy who seems like he must have been there forever. And that guy is telling him everything about the company and what he needs to know and that sort of stuff. And so the new guy says, hey, that's great. Thanks for sharing. How long have you worked here? And the old timer says, ever since they threatened to fire me. That's how long I've been working. So maybe you know people like that who work just enough so they don't get fired, right? And then the company pays them just enough so they don't quit, right? And they work out this sort of sick, you know, relationship. Well, the thing about real estate, I'm going to say it plainly. Real estate is a non-salaried, commission-only profession. That means it can be a high paying hard job and it can be a very low paying easy one as well. Financial rewards. Um, how many transactions would you have to do in Silicon Valley to earn $1 million in gross commission income? The answer is if we're using a price point of a million dollars, like a million dollar house, um, and you did 40 of those transactions, you would have grossed about $1 million in commissions. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about planning and that sort of thing, but um, that's a lot of money. You could probably live on that, right? You might have to cut back a little, I, I realize, but you could probably live on that. Now, you might be saying, you know, gee, if I made a million dollars, there's no way I would even know how to begin to spend all that money, right? That I'm sure that was a thought that went through your heads. Well, one of the things that you might do with the money is invest in real estate. There's an old saying um, by a former philosopher and comedian by the name of Will Rogers, and he said, buy land, they're not making any more of it. So many people that become wealthy in the United States do so as a result of their investments in real estate. We live on our commissions, but we retire on our investments. And let's say you wanted to be a real estate investor. 
being in real estate is obviously a very good place to be. You know more about what's going on. You find properties before everybody else gets their meat hooks into them. You know more about trends and financing. You understand if you want to be a real estate investor, uh, being in real estate would be a good way to begin. Security. Uh, that may seem like a strange thing for an independent contractor, but um, I had a friend who went to San Jose State Mechanical engineering is what his degree was in. He went to work for Hitachi in their hard drive division. And after 28 years, they laid him off. They said it wasn't personal, nothing personal, right? Because they laid off everybody in his department in that division. In fact, they closed the entire plant. And I'm not saying he was a perfect engineer, but even if he had been a perfect engineer, he still would have been laid off. Because nobody was deciding that what he did wasn't any good. They just decided we don't need anybody doing it here anymore. Now, because being in real estate, you're an independent contractor, and it's like having your own business, you can fail at it. You can be bad at it, but you really can't get fired. Right? You understand if you don't get along with us, you can take your license and go down the street to another office. If you don't get along with anyone, well, you got issues, but if you don't get along with anyone, you just tough it out for two years, and then go get your broker's license and you can work out of your home if that's what you choose to do. You understand there is a security in having control of your own business and your destiny. What are the traits of a successful real estate agent? Notice how they all magically begin with the letter E. I like to point that out because it you know, took me a long time to work it out that way. Um, the first one is ethics, and what we know is, is that when the, uh, the union, the National Association of Realtors, surveys buyers and sellers every year, and they ask them the question, how did you meet your real estate agent? That about 40% of the time, they say they were referred by somebody, and about another 12 to 14% of the time, they say they had worked with the agent before. So you understand about half at least of all real estate transactions come from people referring or who have past customers and clients and referrals from people. How do you get referrals? And the answer is you need to go do a good job when you work with people the first time. It's like a restaurant. Right. If you have bad food and bad service, then people do not come back and eat. Right. You need new customers every day. Obviously, you want repeat and referral business. Ego drive. Self-confidence is probably a better description. But remember, I was doing the E thing and, you know, and, you know, it didn't begin with E. <laughs> and what I what I mean by that is that what you're essentially paid to do in the real estate business is to have conversations with people. And the more people you talk to, the more likely you are to get paid. You understand if you only talk to some people about real estate, then you're only going to get paid some. But if you talk to a lot of people about real estate, then you're going to get paid a lot. You understand it's a function of how many people you talk to. And one good part of this is, is that virtually everybody, everyone you know and everyone you meet is likely to want to buy sell or invest in real estate, if not now, then sometime in the future. So if you talk to people, some people are going to say, yeah, I'm interested now in selling my house and buying a house. I mean, let's go do it. And sometimes they're not interested now and they're going to say no. So this is where the self-confidence comes in. Because the agents that are making the most money in real estate oftentimes have been told no the most often. They've also been told yes the most often, and that's because they've talked to a lot more people. How do you feel about having conversations with people about real estate and having them not be interested now? So tell me, uh, when do you plan on selling your house? Never, right? Are you interested in buying a home in the near future? No, right? Now, that doesn't mean no, not ever. It just means not now. And there's a, a saying that we have that the fortune is made from the follow-up. We know that about 70% of all real estate transactions come not just from that initial contact, 
but from following up with those contacts. Empathy is not the same thing as sympathy. If I'm walking by a lake and I see somebody drowning and I stand there and I watch them drown and I feel real bad, right? Because I just watched somebody drown, that's sympathy. If I jumped in the water and swam out to save them, that's empathy. So what we're really paid to do in the real estate business is to help people solve problems. If buyers and sellers did not have problems, then they would not need real estate agents, right? So the more problems we solve, the more likely we are to be paid. How do you feel about working with people that have problems? Enthusiasm. Now, drive is a better word, but remember I'm doing the E's, right? And I don't mean you have to be a bubbly type A personality, but you have to have drive. Um, you have to, sometimes you have to follow up with people multiple times over a long period of time. It's going to take a lot of coaxing, a lot of effort, right? It doesn't just happen all at once. You have to have en enthusiasm for the business and drive to keep things moving along. Energy. You don't punch a time clock, but you don't sleep till noon either. You understand um, the people who are successful in real estate put in time in the business. Now, the amount of time we're going to talk about later a little bit, but they have to, you have to make an effort. You have to get up and go to work every day if you're serious about making money in the business. Now, where I think about this, though, let's say the job you have now, assuming you have one, uh, you get up tomorrow morning and you say, boy, today is the first day of the rest of my life. And you start early and you work hard and you work through lunch and you stay late and you do that for a year. And my question would be, how much more money would you be making than you are right now? And for a lot of people, the answer is, oh, I wouldn't be making hardly any more money if any more money at all, right? That, that, that just isn't there. I can't make that much more money. So what I believe is that for most people, if you put as much energy into real estate as you currently do for other people, you could make a whole lot more money. And education. Getting a real estate license is like getting a fishing license in that the license does not catch fish. So it's not that you get a real estate license and you put it on the wall and people come by the office and they drop off money, right? I think people believe that's, that's what happens. Um, there's actually steps in between the license on the wall and, and, and money coming to the office. And so you need to learn how to be a successful agent. You don't have to be a natural born salesperson. Many of our top people are not natural born salespeople. These are things that can be taught and learned, but you, you would need to go learn them. What is needed to succeed? Goals and plan, training and coaching, and the tools and systems. Let me give you an example. Let's say you had a goal to sell one house a month, 12 transactions, with an average price of $1 million. That would, under our current, you know, general average type of a commission, you would be grossing from that $1 million transaction a month about $300,000. That would be your gross commission income, $300,000. So, in order to sell a house, you are going to have to have appointments, either virtual or in person, with people where you're explaining to them the process and what's going on and getting their commitment to move forward. It's not probably a one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, in order to get a closed transaction, you're probably going to need, let's say, four appointments. So if you met with four people that wanted to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, you would have a good chance of having one of them that's going to buy, sell, or invest in real estate. So if you want to close 12 transactions and you need four appointments to close a transaction, that means you need 48 appointments in order to close those 12 transactions. So that, by the way, is one appointment a week for 48 weeks. That's a month. You take a month off, right? Because you're in real estate, right? So you take a month off. You're averaging one appointment a week for 48 weeks. Um, that would lead probably to 12 transactions. So now the question is, how do I get the, the appointment a week? 
And that let's say as a rule of thumb that you're going to need to have 50 conversations with people about buying, selling, or investing in real estate in order for them to make it, in order for you to get one appointment. So you need 50 conversations to get an appointment. So that would mean on an average five day work week, you would need to be having 10 conversations a day. If you had 10 conversations a day with people buying, selling, or investing in real estate, that would probably give you the appointment a week, which would give you the transaction a month, which means you could go buy a Tesla, right? another one, a newer one maybe a bigger one so now the question is all right where who would i talk to who am i going to have these conversations with and you would start by talking to the people you already know because you already know them right and people that you know or people that they know might be interested in buying selling or investing in real estate after that you need to talk to people you don't know and because you probably don't know enough people to make a career just out of talking to them and then depending upon your personality style and a bunch of other criteria, we would help you develop a plan where it would fit the way you are and it would help you have those 50 conversations a week in order to do the appointment for the transaction. Uh, how, are real, I've already said, how are real estate agents paid? If we sell a million dollar house, the commission, gross commission might be as much as $60,000 at 6%. And there's two sides in a real estate transaction. There's the listing side and the selling side, which is the buyer's side. And although it doesn't have to be this way, it would typically be split 50-50 between the two, which means each office would gross $30,000. Now, if you're a brand new salesperson just getting started in the real estate business, many offices will start you on a 50-50 commission split, which means if you found somebody that wanted to sell their home and it eventually sold, you'd make $15,000. And if you found somebody that wanted to buy a home and they eventually bought, you'd make $15,000. Can you see an advantage to not only finding the person who wants to buy the home, but finding the person who wants to sell the home at the same time? And the answer is, yeah, we call that being a, a double agent. No, no, a dual agent. That's what that's called and now you're getting $30,000. So how much money can you make? Well, how often can you do one of those two things? If you found two people that wanted to buy and two people that wanted to sell, that'd be 60. If you found eight people that wanted to, four that wanted to buy and four that wanted to be sell, that'd be 120. Well, you can see where that's going. Now, the reality is that these numbers are way off. They're way off. And the reason they're way off is because in real estate, the more money you make, well, the, let's just say the more money you make. So we typically begin agents on a 60-40 split. It includes a coaching and a mentoring and a training program. Because on your first few transactions, your first three, we have to drag you through those transactions. And then after your first three transactions, it goes to 70% to you and 30% to the office. After a few more, 80% to you and 20% to the office, it can go all the way up to 90% percent to you and 10 percent of the office you understand the more money you make the more money you make now obvious arithmetic would be if at a 50 percent let's start with 60 percent that's eighteen thousand dollars at 80 percent it's twenty four thousand dollars and at 90 percent it's twenty seven thousand dollars there's a relationship like a teeter-totter between what the office is going to do for you to help you get started and your commission split. And what that means, at, at the beginning of your career, there's an inverse relationship between the split and your likelihood of being successful. The higher the split, the less they're going to do to help you. Right? You understand you can get a higher split, but they'll do less. And at the beginning, you need help. And so, um, and, and some offices just charge a lot of fees. I'll talk about that later. Your options are you could be a referral only agent. The good news of that is you don't have to join the Association of Realtors. You don't have to join the union. And there's dues involved in joining the union. I have a team. I have agents in Oakland and San Mateo and Santa Cruz and all over the place. And there is a team and I mentor people and you could join the team and that would be uh, another option. You could be a part-timer, I call it dual career, 
and some of them are on my team as well. I have agents that work at Apple and Facebook and a bunch of other places. Um, or just have other commitments with family and that sort of thing. And then you could be a full-time, even a big-time agent. These are different options. So if you're choosing an office, um, there are different, generally speaking, there's national offices, boutique offices, and cloud brokerages. My background is I spent a really long time let's just say, as the vice president and director of training for Century 21. I was the vice president of the largest Century 21 group in Northern California um, for more than 20 years, let's, let's just say, more than 20 years. Our top office was ranked number three in the United States. At one point, we had five locations and over 600 agents. I spent seven years as a productivity coach, recruiter, and trainer for Keller Williams. So I know what the national big box brokers have, and they have tools and they have stuff, and you've heard of them. Then there are boutiques, and the boutiques are smaller, and some of them have little or no training. And then there are cloud brokerages where they don't even have offices at all, and everything is online. What I'm doing right now is sort of a merger of the three where I work for a boutique brokerage, but I'm providing the same training and tools that you would get from the national brokerages. Plus our component is online as well, so that uh, I have people that are in Sacramento and Oakland and all over the place, all over the place. Um, coaching, remember I said, well, to do 12 transactions, you have to have so many appointments and then you need so many contacts. That's what coaching is about, creating a plan. Training is looks a lot like this, where I go through you know, how to fill out the purchase contract, how to find buyers and sellers and investors. And mentoring means that I help people with their transactions. I'll talk to their clients. I'll help them make presentations. I'll answer their questions, even late at night. Um, in order to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Now, let me just say one thing before we move on, is the market is shifting. Um, you might have heard that there's things going on. And so what, let me see if this is on here. What I'm doing is I'm um, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, today's Monday, Wednesday at 11 o'clock a.m., for about one hour or so, I'm having a special seminar called um, Selling Real Estate in the Age of COVID-19, uh, How to Survive and Prosper During the Upcoming Shift in the Market. What I'm going to be talking about in that seminar is, first of all, what is the short-term implications of all this? How do we show homes? How do we do open houses? How do you have presentations? I sold a house to a buyer that I'd never met in person and the house I had not seen in person through, well, the technology, right? That sort of thing. So we're gonna talk about what those shifts look like and how that's going to change and what kind of impacts they're gonna have in the real estate business and how real estate agents might need to adjust, uh, register for the webinar. It, it would be probably a useful thing if you're interested, serious about getting started in real estate. Speaking of getting started in real estate, there, in order to get a real estate license, you have to do two things. One is you have to complete three college level courses. That does not mean you have to go to college, right? We have that as part of our package. And number two is you have to pass the salesperson's licensing exam given by the California Department of Real Estate. Those are two separate requirements. Three college level courses in real estate pass an exam given by the state. When you've done those two things, you could apply and get a salesperson's license. Before you can take the state exam, you have to have a college level course in real estate principles, a college course in real estate practice, and an elective. And the elective can come from any one of these. Notice accounting, economics, and business law is on the list. If you have ever taken accounting, economics or business law from a junior college or better and you can get your hands on a copy of the transcript it doesn't have to be an original this isn't like applying to harvard you have the third course now people sometimes say well i have all of those i have accounting and economics and business law 
it's not going to help you because you only need one from this list. If you don't have those, the one we include in our package is legal aspects of real estate. And even if you have an accounting you know, degree, you might want to take that course because the Department of Real Estate is not going to ask accounting questions on the state exam, but they're going to ask a lot of real estate law questions. So our package includes legal aspects. How would you get these two college level courses? You could go to college. Very few people do that because it's expensive and time consuming. And I don't know, it just isn't done as much. And our program, our system is online. And the way an online college level course works is you enroll in the course, you um, wait a minimum of 18 days. And at the end of 18 days, you are eligible to take the final exam for that college course. You don't have to take it in 18 days. You just can't take it any sooner than 18 days. Now the final exam, for the three college level courses are online final exams. You can take the final exams at home and they're open book tests. Let me go over that one more time. The three final exams for the college level courses are online at home, open book, cheat as much as you want to. Final exams, you can cheat as much as you want to. They give you three hours to get 75 out of 100 questions right. Did I mention that this is an open book test, right? And even if you 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 get you have the PDF of the the, the textbook, and uh, you'd understand first of all, in three hours you could on the internet you could Google the uh, topics and look up 75 out of 100 questions. And the outlines are in a PDF format, and a PDF is a searchable document, which means, let's say, there's a question about FERPTA, which is a law that deals with foreign investors. It's a tax thing, and you're like, I have no idea what this is, and they're asking me a question about FERPTA. Well, you go to your, your book, right, the PDF, and you do Control F or Command F, depending on your religion, and you type in F-I-R-P-T-A and you hit enter and it's going to start showing you everywhere in the book that FERPTA is mentioned. You also could look in the table of contents and you could look at the index and you could, oh, that's so 15% and you get the answer. Does everybody understand? This is not a difficult thing to do. The final exams are online, they're open book, you can cheat as much as you want to, you get three hours to finish one. Now that you've done that, you have your three certificates of completion for the three college courses, you're now eligible eligible to go take the state exam. The state licensing test is not an online test that you can take at home. You have to physically go to one of their centers. Now, right now, because of the shelter in place, they're not doing tests in April, they're scheduling tests in May, they're just having fewer people in the room, they're spread out, there's going to be distancing, but um, the locations where you can physically go to take the exam are Oakland, Sacramento, Fresno, Orange County, and San Diego. That's it, right? One, pick one of those, and you have to go take the test. It is not an open book test. Right, they have people watching you to make sure you do not cheat. You can't cheat as much as you want to. It's 150 multiple guess, I mean multiple choice questions, A, B, C, D, pick the best answer, no essays, no short answer essays, no fill in the blanks. You have to get 70% of the questions right in order to pass. Does that sound like a high score to require 70%. Let's say you're you're laying on the operating table and your brain surgeon comes in and pulling on their gloves, they announce that they passed, they might be new to this brain surgery thing, but don't worry, they passed the brain surgeon's exam, they got 70% of the questions right. I nailed that test, I, I got 70%. Does that sound like a good score for a brain surgeon? You understand the brain surgeon with a 70% score missed more than one out of every four questions they asked 
him or her about the subject of brain surgery, that doesn't that doesn't sound very good. So my point is, you do not need to be a brain surgeon to get a real estate license. You might you might have already known that. All you need to do is get 70% of the questions right and you're in. Having said that, every time the Department of Real Estate gives their test, they fail more than 50% of the people in the room. And many of those people, they have failed before. You can take this test an unlimited number of times. I have met too many people that have failed it 10 or more times. They decided they might want to take a course. I don't know. You need to understand that almost 70% of the people fail on the first try. 50% fail, more than 50% fail every time they give the test. And 100% of those people failing, all of them, have been able to successfully complete those three online open book cheat as much as you want to college courses. They all did the three college courses because they won't let you take the exam without doing the three college courses. My point is doing the three college courses does not mean you're getting a real estate license. It simply means you've done the minimum amount that the state requires to go take a shot at the test. But as you can see, it's not enough for most people. What I do is I teach people how to pass the exam. I have 12 classes. They're sliced up like a pizza in that they're, I don't know, warm and cheesy and because there's no first slice. In other words, the, the pizza doesn't have a first piece, it's whichever piece you take. So I teach my classes as independent modules. They do not build on each other. You could start with any one of them. You can take them in any order and you can repeat them as often as you can stand it. They're now all being broadcast on Wednesday night from 6.30 to about 8.45. They're all recorded. You can watch the recordings whenever you feel like. So right now, we're only enrolling people in the middle one of these, which is a live broadcast webinar and replay for $398. That includes the college level courses. It includes the uh, video replays, a practice testing program, a Saturday workshop. It includes, the, I mentioned the college, it includes everything that you need to get a real estate license, $398. The college level credit comes from an affiliate of ours called Online Ed. Online Ed is approved by the California Department of Real Estate to issue the certificates of completion you need to go take the exam. I teach how to pass the exam and provide a exhaustive series of sample questions and practice testing to get you ready. So these are the four components of the system. There's college level courses, live classes broadcast on the internet, practice testing, which you do at home, and a Saturday workshop, a cram class, which is also done by webinar right now, that um, you take right before you go take the test. I have a high pass rate. I encourage you to come and sit through a class as a guest so you can see you know, if you like it or not. Um, the timeline for all this right now is gonna take a little bit longer because things are taking a little bit longer. But under a normal market and a normal timeline, it would take a minimum of three and a half months. It takes 18 days or about two and a half weeks to finish each of the college courses and they have to be done sequentially. You can't do all three of them at once. So it would take you seven and a half weeks minimum to go through the three college level courses. Only then can you apply to take the state exam. It was running eight weeks to get a test date, but because they're giving a test to 10 people at a time rather than 32 at a time, you understand it's taking longer for people to get test dates. It's probably another month, but that may not go on forever. So that just gives you a sense as to what the time would be. One other thing you have to do while you're waiting to get a test date is have your fingerprints taken and processed. Uh, we have all the forms and everything to do that. Um, that takes about six weeks. After you've passed the exam, your license is issued. It's good for four years. Every four years, you need to renew it. That costs $245. That's more information to reach out to us if you have questions. But what you might want to do is to just go there and take a guest lesson. I'll show you that link in a bit. I have pretty good reviews. Um, a year or so ago, I stopped um, paying Yelp for ads. 
I stopped advertising on Yelp. And what they did is they filtered about 150 five-star reviews off of my page. I don't know who would have thought. Uh, this was a screenshot before they um, started the filtering. You can see at that point I had 123 reviews and if you look at the breakdown this is the good and the the bad right i'm showing everything right now you can see i have in fact not performed perfectly um, um i i have received a four-star review one 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 four-star review i've gotten over it um stopped looking for the person all of that sort of stuff and if you look at my filtered reviews in the yelp page you'll see hundreds more of um, these reviews. Right now, they're only showing about 48, but you'll see more than 100 five-star reviews. And I'll tell you something about Yelp. Because I stopped advertising and they filtered as many of my five-star reviews as they could get away with, I'll tell you this. If I had any bad reviews, you would be seeing them if you went to my, went to my Yelp page. Um, if you wanted to take a free class just to see if you can stand 11 more of them, you go to my website, dreclass.com, click on the button, right? And the button, um, the button here, which says free guest lesson, right? You click on that button and you now can sign up to take a free class, see what you think. If you want to enroll, this is the option, and the, the second option is the one that you want, um, which is the webinar, live webinars, with streaming, you can ask questions. Um, every Wednesday night, they're also recorded, $398. This is when we have live classes, and who knows when that's gonna happen again. And these at the bottom are for people that have already taken the college level courses. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's what I've got. If you have any questions now, would be a good time to ask them. I right, don't see a lot of hands going up. So if you have any questions, reach out to us. Come to my webinar on Wednesday. It'll be fun. Well, it'll be, uh, we'll talk very specifically about how the market is changing and how real estate agents need to change. And I look forward to seeing you in class.